the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in, the, in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. If you're anything like me, this pandemic has caused you to be hyper-focused on probabilities. For a while there, when COVID was spiking back during the holiday season, there was a number that really stood out to me, and it shocked and even scared me. It said that if you lived in the city of Chicago and were attending a gathering of 10 people, there was a 60% chance that one of those folks was infected with the virus. That's a high probability of transition. And it was a reason that I, and I'm assuming probably many of you, decided that this would instead be a Zoom holiday with family and friends. And that probably wasn't an easy decision to make, but with a 60% chance of infection, I'm not taking those odds. I'm willing to bet that even when making other decisions in our lives, we do a lot of odds calculations and go with the choice that gives us the best odds of avoiding unnecessary suffering and pain. I know that when I'm leaving for a trip in the car, I try to give myself the best chance of avoiding any traffic, especially rush hour traffic in Chicago, because for me, sitting in traffic is painful suffering. Or to flip that, we also make the decision to do things so that they not only avoid pain and suffering, but have the most opportunity to do the most good. It reminds me of the time when we were transitioning from serving our South Loop community table meal here at Grace Place to where we are now at Second Presbyterian Church. And we had to pick a location that was, and a time that would give us the best chance of serving the most people. So we decided that Second Presbyterian Church, which is located by a bus station and a train and is walkable from the loop where many of our guests who are experiencing homelessness come from, we thought that would be a great location. We also decided to stick with our Sunday night serving time, which is a time in the week when many community meals and soup kitchens are taking a break. You see, probabilities affect much of what we do. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. In fact, I want to affirm decisions that are made to increase the odds of avoiding needless pain and suffering and promoting the most good. But if there's anything that we can take from our scripture lessons today, it's that God is a God of improbable outcomes. Let's take a look by starting with our first reading from Genesis. At 99 years old, God makes the covenant with Abraham, promising that he and Sarah will be exceedingly numerous and that they will have ancestors and they will be ancestors of a multitude of nations. I think if God wanted a higher probability of success with fertility here, maybe 
God would make a covenant with someone younger than 99 years old. That would just be my take on all of that. But I'm not God. We remember in this story that we worship a God of improbable outcomes. And Paul, in his reading, in his writings from Romans today, he elaborates on this story and the audacious covenant that God would make with Abraham and Sarah when, in Paul's words, Abraham's body was as good as dead and Sarah's womb was barren. Even in the face of such odds, Paul describes Abraham and Sarah as hoping against hope that they would bear a child in their old age. Their trust and faith remained steadfast in the covenant that God made with them. They were fully convinced that God would do what God promised. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, admiring the faith of Abraham and Sarah, we have to remember that from this past summer, when we were reading this very same story, that this was actually the second covenant that God made with Abraham and Sarah regarding their fertility and their ability to bear a child. This was the second covenant. And between that first and second covenant, Abraham and Sarah actually got impatient with God's first improbable covenant. And they took the matter into their own hands. They wanted to increase their odds of having a child. And so Abraham conceived a child with Hagar. And even after this second covenant is made, after Hagar gives birth to Ishmael, even after this second covenant, when the Lord comes to visit Sarah and Abraham and says to them that Sarah will bear a son, Sarah laughs to herself as she overhears the Lord saying that. The Lord responds, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Is there anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. All of this is to say that even Sarah and Abraham, who received not one, but two direct covenants from God about having a son in their old age, they still have their doubts and decide to take matters into their own hands and create their own more probable outcome. But God is still a God of improbable outcomes. And eventually Isaac is born to Sarah and born against all odds. But it's our doubt and our desire, desire to have more probable certainty in our lives. It's not going to prevent God from creating life in places where we thought death had prevailed or create love where we thought hatred had prevailed or create light where we thought darkness had prevailed or create goodness where we thought evil had prevailed. But we still doubt. We still have these moments where our desire for more certainty overcomes us. But we can still sing the hymn by Desmond Tutu. Goodness is stronger than evil. Love is stronger than hate. Light is stronger than darkness. Life is stronger than death. Victory is ours. Victory is ours through God who loves us. Victory is ours. Victory is ours through God who loves us. That's the hymn we can sing when we are in those moments of doubt and desire for certainty. We can sing to this God of improbable outcomes. So what does our gospel today from Mark have to say about this God of improbable outcomes? Well, for one, Jesus tells his disciples that he must undergo suffering. He must die and that he will rise again after three days from the dead. And this suffering and death and resurrection, it's too improbable for Peter to handle. So he rebukes Jesus. To which Jesus rebukes Peter right back and says, get behind me, Satan, for you're setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Maybe what Jesus is saying to us is that our way, our human way of doing things is not God's way. Having our mind on human things is like doing everything to keep everything under control. So we project that on God. We hope that God too is a 
God who controls everything around us. But the love of God is anything but controlling. Well, we might make our decisions based on probability or make calculated decisions to avoid suffering. Jesus will not dial back his own ministry to spare his own life or even ease his own suffering. You see, Jesus loves with reckless abandon and does not control our response to this love. And that's why he's killed. He's killed because his vision of God's kingdom and his commitment to the healing of humanity literally knows no limits, and we could not handle that. But even the death of Christ cannot control or contain God's love or life-giving power. And Jesus, in fact, rises from the dead, making for us an improbable covenant that we too will experience resurrection by the power of God's grace. Despite this improbable covenant that we have with God, we are sure to doubt God's victory over death, evil, hatred, and darkness. And we will make decisions like Abraham and Sarah that attempt to take this covenant into our own, own hands and make the outcome more probable or predictable. But God is still a God of improbable outcomes. Jesus is asking of us now an improbable, if not an impossible thing to follow him by denying ourselves and taking up our crosses. Jesus even goes on to say, for those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. This improbable challenge sets out for us the cost of discipleship. And while there is real Christian persecution in this world, I think many American Christians have erroneously tried to claim this persecution for themselves, as we have seen most recently in our world, for not being able to worship in person during this pandemic. But I want to relay the words to you of one biblical scholar who put it this way. What makes the ministry of Jesus countercultural, and therefore the object of earthly hostility, is not that it is quote-unquote Christian per se, but that it abides no impediment for the immediate restoration of the broken and the outcast. Let me say that one more time, just so you get it. What makes the ministry of Jesus countercultural and therefore the object of earthly hostility is not that it's Christian per se, but that it abides no impediment to the immediate restoration of the broken and the outcast. That's the reality. This improbable imagination that Jesus is trying to get us to see with. But our efforts, our efforts are to make things more probable or more predictable. And those aren't all entirely bad, but we have to acknowledge the ways in which our probable and predictable lives are at most times an, an attempt to save ourselves, an attempt to save ourselves from having to hope against hope and trust in God's improbable outcomes for our lives and for the life of this world. We can easily talk ourselves out of these improbable divine things that Jesus wants us to see. If we just have some probable human things in our presence, and we would rather put our trust in those. But as we will soon see come Easter, death evil, hatred, and darkness, they have already lost. And we need not give them any more power because victory is ours. Victory is ours through God who loves us. Amen.